Welcome to Nonconventional, where we interview unconventional people or people with unconventional lives. My name is Ila Crane, and today I have Ringu Tulkarin Poche with me. Ringu Tulkarin Poche was trained in all schools of Tibetan Buddhism. He was recognized by His Holiness the 16th Karmapa. He has around 20 books published and he started a non-profit organization in Brussels called Bodhicharya. And he's been teaching in the West since 1990s and earlier in Tibet for another 25 years before that. Hello Rinpoche, welcome. Thank you. Um, Rinpoche, we just came out of a week-long retreat together. It was an honor and pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. During the retreat, you mentioned about life in Tibet in 1950s. You were born in 1952 in Tibet, correct? Right. Um, what was it like in Tibet back in those days? Because I imagine from what you shared with us that it was very different than 1950s Europe. I think so. I think so. Uh, as I remember, I was born in 1952, and uh, I can remember uh, very clearly when my brother was born, and that was 1954. And I remember things from there uh, very clearly uh, until uh, I uh, arrived, we arrived in uh, India in 1959. And um, that time uh, in Tibet, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was totally different. Uh, I sometimes feel that it was like uh, uh, 8th century in uh, other parts of the world, probably. Uh, because um, in most of the places uh, in Tibet, uh, you know, we, there, is, there isn't any, any cars. There was no cars. There was no even money. Uh, where I, I was born, there was no cash, uh, there was not much shops. Uh, then uh, uh, we didn't even have matchbox. We used to make fire with uh, a kind of a iron uh, and a, a stone like a crystal. And then uh, there was a, uh, uh, some kind of a herb dried, so put that a little bit in the uh, crystal and then put it towards uh, like this with the iron and then it sparks and makes fire and then we have to make fire uh, like that. So, you know, uh, we used to ride horses. Uh, there was no, uh, no motorable road, there was never any motorable road. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was very different. So, from what you remember, because you were there um, very young, I think you said you left in 1950? Yeah, uh, we revolted uh, against the uh, Chinese occupation uh, in 1957, I think. Uh, at one time, uh, it was the uh, Tibet, the Eastern Tibet, which is uh, called Kham, uh, that time was divided into small uh, kind of kingdoms and things like that. And uh, we belonged to a kingdom called Ling, Lingchang. Then one time, one day, uh, the Chinese authorities invited most of the uh, high people, uh, ministers and, you know, important people, lamas and things like that, uh, to the palace uh, of that kingdom. And then uh, uh, they said it was a meeting, but actually uh, they took all of them in prison inside the palace. 
so it was found out. So then uh, some local people uh, made a kind of a army because uh, at that time everybody had, had guns. Uh, all the people in, in that area, most of the part of Tibet in Kham uh, had their had gun. Uh, but uh, no bullets, you know. Uh, if they had like uh, hundred bullets, that would be the you know most highly armed. So they attacked the palace, and then they released uh, all the prisoners, uh, including the king and the queen and everybody. Uh, so therefore, then uh, the Chinese army came from uh, everywhere, and then you know, was chasing us. Uh, so therefore we had to run away. And that's the beginning of our, you know, leaving motherland, you can call it. Uh, and then we were just uh, traveling around. We didn't know where to go uh, because we didn't have any kind of idea uh, where to go. It was just running away, you know, from the uh, army. Uh, so we were mostly traveling at night and hiding uh, in the daytime in the mountains, you know. Uh, the, it's, the, Tibet is a very big uh, land and there were lots of, you know, mountains and, you know, uh, all kinds of places where uh, you could easily hide and uh, nobody would know. So it took us a long time to get to Lhasa. Mm maybe 1950, sometime in 1958. And so, you know, uh, then again, uh, at the end of uh, 58, we were somewhere in the border of uh, Tibet and uh, Bhutan and Nepal, not Nepal, more towards the Indian border, Arunachal Pradesh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, we were there until His Holiness Dalai Lama left Tibet, and then we also followed that. So, you know, uh, we were traveling inside Tibet for 57, 58, so about two years. Mm, yes. So mainly on horseback. And uh, in the beginning, uh, I was riding a horse. Uh, Everybody used to ride horses, even when they were very young. Uh, so I, although I was um, like only three, four years, four years, five years old, I could easily ride horse. So I had a small horse, and then um, uh, they would put uh, two small kind of uh, kind of pegs and two in the behind. Uh, and then put a kind of rope around uh, so that if I, if I fell asleep, I would not fall down. <laughs> uh, so this way I was riding the horse and because we had to ride day and night, sometimes lots of night, so, you know, sometimes I would fall asleep and, you know, she could fall. So uh, we were traveling like that for, um, uh, for some time. Uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we had to cross uh, big rivers, you know, and things like that. So once we were crossing uh, a big river, so my horse got injured on one of the uh, feet, and so uh, the horse could not uh, go, so they had to leave the horse. Since then, then uh, they made a small uh, kind of a box uh, uh, inside, you know, this uh, small kind of uh, branches. Mm. And then outside, uh, yak hide, uh, put yak hide. And it is light, but, you know, dried. And so they made uh, two of these boxes with a hood on that. So, you know, two children, myself and another child, were put in there, and then we travel at the back of a 
horse or mule uh, from then onwards. So uh, that's how <laughs> I traveled out of Tibet. And we are talking about crossing the Himalayas here in potentially winter conditions too. So in Tibet, we, you know, we were already like uh, almost two years uh, traveling and uh, uh, inside Tibet it was a little bit like same as the, you know, uh, Himalayas uh, because uh, it was uh, mostly, you know, uh, very high altitude. Tibet is uh, very high altitude. Most of the places, um, at least uh, 4,000, 4,000 feet and uh, could be higher. And then mountains, you know, there are lots of mountains and things like that. Uh, and then at the end, yes, when we came into, uh, into India, uh, then that is, you know, really crossing through the Himalayas. And then uh, there you could not even uh, have horses because, you know, the, the mountains were so, uh, so steep uh, as, uh, in certain areas that even horses cannot, uh, cannot pass. So we had to leave horses and then uh, walk. How many people started this journey in Pushe? Uh, when we first started, we were quite a lot, you know, we were many, many hundreds. Uh, I can't say exactly the number, but uh, many hundreds. And then, uh, you know, uh, when we travel, sometimes we are attacked by the Chinese army. And once attacked, then everybody would, you know, scatter. Uh, some people would be killed, some people... Uh, just get scattered. Uh, some people uh, get, you know, uh, uh, caught. So uh, everybody would be, you know. And then slowly, slowly, again, you know, we come together and sometimes some new people also join us and then again becomes a group. And then sometimes, you know, another attack and things like that. So we had a few different kind of uh, incidents like that. Yeah. And how were you locating yourselves and how did you find food throughout this journey during these two years? Well, uh, food in Tibet is uh, very simple, you know. Uh, they eat uh, mainly tsampa. Uh, tsampa is uh, uh, the barley roasted and then ground. And that is like uh, uh, already ready-made food. And that you would eat uh, with tea. Uh, there are two ways of eating tsampa. One is in the bowl, you put tea, some butter, and then tsampa, and then mix it up and eat it. Another way is put tsampa, put some butter, put tea on it, and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you use some dry cheese uh, inside that, you know, cheese kind of powder, dry cheese powder. You could eat uh, with uh, like uh, with meat or, you know, some other things also, yogurt and, but that sampa was really the main, uh, main food uh, of Tibet. And it's very easy because you don't have to cook. You know, it's already cooked. You just have to boil the tea and that's it. So that was, you know, uh, and uh, usually in Tibet, uh, because there was, uh, uh, especially, you know, uh, uh, maybe there are some kind of, uh, kind of hotel or some kind of, uh, in really big city like Lhasa, but most part of the Tibet, there was no hotel uh, or anything, the restaurant or hotel or anything like that. So if there was other people, you know, they would uh, always give, you know, they would help uh, to, to give food and, you know, um, there's no other accommodation, but some, you know, everybody would bring their own tents and things like that, if that. So, you know, you just sit there 
and so therefore, you know, food is uh, usually shared and given by people. Even when usually, you know, when there was no, uh, not like this situation, uh, almost everybody would go to Lhasa and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes Mount Kailash and on pilgrimage. Everybody would go on pilgrimage at least once in their lifetime. And uh, they would just carry a little bit of champa or whatever food they have, and they just go, you know. And uh, then when they see some uh, settlement, like, you know, uh, some families or some, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Yak farmers, yak nomads, or you know farmers who uh, till land and uh, you know grow uh, wheat or you know uh, barley and things like that. You just go there and then uh, uh, they'll give you some some food and you carry that. You eat them and then carry the rest and then you walk and uh, you you walk till you get to the next. Uh, place where you find some other people and they give you some and like this they they travel years uh, and then they come back you know they usually they have no money because there is no money so uh, it's hardly you can buy something <laughs> so they give that's the that used to be the way so would people barter yeah, that is something, that, that's the kind of uh, uh, business, usually the way of business. Usually in Tibet, there were like uh, two different kind of, uh, uh, you can say, uh, livelihood. Uh, one is, uh, you know, growing uh, crops like uh, barley and uh, wheat and uh, uh, some things like that, you know. So they grow, uh, they trade the land and, you know, they grow these crops. And then uh, another uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, society is uh, who has yaks, yaks and uh, sheep. So they are more in the little bit higher grounds or where there is lots of pasture. So they graze uh, the, the yak and sheep, and then usually they would have like uh, two or three different places. Uh, in the summer they go a little bit higher, and the winter they go a little bit uh, lower, but around the area. And they are called nomadic dogpa. So they produce, you know, uh, uh, butter, milk, cheese, uh, meat and, uh, you know, all animal products like uh, uh, yak hair or, you know, a sheep, uh, all kind of uh, uh, sheep skin or uh, wool and all those kind of things. And, and they bring it down uh, to the farmers and they butter it with mm -hmm. barley and wheat and things like that. And that's how they, they live. Mm -hmm. uh, they only one thing uh, they need from outside, usually for, in, in terms of food, that's tea. Uh, they usually uh, import tea, tea leaves from China. Uh, and then uh, like clothes and uh, other things from India. Uh, so uh, life is very simple. Yeah, I assume because walking was a main one of the main ways of traveling. I yeah, assume, walking or uh, horse riding. This horse riding. Tour, yeah. I assume people had better sense of orientation and direction then. But still, how did you? I mean, you were very young, but do you remember like how you oriented as a group across the mountains, across the Himalayas? Well, you know. Uh, uh, People uh, have a s little bit sense of direction because you know you look at the sun and things like that, and uh, you have, but then you, you know uh, people ask uh, you know people from the local where to go and how to go, and you know it's a 
you know, kind of direction. And uh, people have a sense of, you know, uh, which, which place is there in this direction and things like that. You know, people have, uh, people travel a lot, actually. The people of uh, Tibet travel a lot. Uh, they travel mainly, you know, uh, on horseback. Uh, but uh, generally, um, of course, the way we traveled, it was a little bit different, but generally uh, they get up very early, you know, uh, down when the, uh, when, you know, it's not completely, uh, it's a little bit light, but not completely light, it's early down. And then, uh, you know, they uh, take down the, the tents, uh, usually they make a tea and they eat uh, something like breakfast, uh, some samba <laughs> usually. <laughs> uh, and then uh, they load the animals, uh, usually yak or, or uh, if it's only, uh, they sometimes, they, mostly they travel with yaks uh, or, or if they want to travel very light and very quick then uh, horses and mules. They load everything on that, and then they they walk. You know, they go, they they travel. But they don't travel very uh, long. You know, when the sun is uh, quite high, and you know, in the early morning, you know, like nine, ten, uh, then they find uh, a nice camping ground, and they stop. They stop. And then they, uh, they stay there overnight because then they need, uh, the animals need to graze. So, you know, uh, then you just uh, you know, stop. So most part of the day, they don't travel, only early morning. Uh, so then they can stay there, they can, you know, uh, they can walk around, they can play, they can do, you know, it's, the traveling is very nice, actually. It's a little bit like a picnic most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, uh, the way we travel, that was another situation, but mostly like that. How much of that travel you made with the group you remember in Porsche? I remember more, more or less of everything. Of course, uh, sometimes it was very hard because, you know, uh, Sometimes we had to, uh, mainly because we had to, uh, we were under danger of being attacked. And uh, 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 many times uh, we had to travel at night. And when you travel at night, um, then you don't see, and you can't even uh, use, you know, uh, like flashlights or, we didn't have much flashlights, but you, you couldn't use any, uh, any lights. Because, because you would be visible. They would be visible. So then uh, there are lots of accidents, you know. Uh, sometimes people even, and sometimes, you know, like horses and yaks fall down over the cliffs and, and people die also. And uh, sometimes you have to cross, you know, like uh, uh, rivers and things like that. And uh, it's quite, you know, strong current rivers and if there's a big big river then uh, you have to make boats because there is no boats you know how do you make boats uh, <laughs> you <laughs> uh, we used to uh, a few occasions we used to make boats with uh, yak hide uh, we used to like uh, uh, the yak hide uh, is it yak leather yak leather yeah. mm. uh, kind of uh, not not dry but uh, uh, wet yak leather uh, then you uh, you make a kind of a, uh, the you have to cut uh, branches uh, and then put it around like this and then uh, put the leather around that and then sew it and then you have to make fire and dry it uh, overnight uh, and then it becomes dry and you know kind of uh, uh, 
hard. Uh, and then if it is really dry, then it, it can remain, you know, in water uh, for some time, you know. So that, then you put on the water and then you, you know, you enter into this and then you row like a boat. But uh, you cannot do more than once, twice, then it start to, you know, become, uh, go, you know, uh, soft and then it can't. So it's sometimes dangerous, you know. Mm. Then you have to again try, and so it's a it's a it's a difficult thing. It's a dangerous thing. Uh, but we had to do this few times, you know, because there are sometimes very big rivers and um, uh, these things. You know, you cannot the cattle and sometimes horses can swim through, uh, but people it's very difficult to swim through. And so sometimes you can hold on to the tail of the horse. Uh, if, if somebody is really good swimmer, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, then they can hold to the, uh, not uh, to the, uh, where there's hair, but, you know, they really, uh, then uh, the horse would carry uh, you, you know, kind drag of, you. yeah, drag you. And, <laughs> but that's not for, uh, you know, uh, for children and, uh, you know, most of the people. So uh, it's a little bit dangerous, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you look back, um, do you remember your interpretations of what was happening around you? Well, we, we knew that um, we were chased by the Chinese army and uh, uh, we could, uh, you know, we could get attacked and we would be uh, easily killed uh, if we are caught or, you know, uh, and we had few times also, you know, the, the, uh, shooting and, you know, the bullet going like this. Uh, I remember also people who have been killed, you know. Uh, the, my, um, I had an uncle, uh, my aunt, uh, my father's, you know, sister, my aunt, uh, her husband and his mother, and uh, there was a group. He was very nice. He was very good with hands, and he was very kind to me. So uh, I used to be very close to him. Uh, and then he used to make lots of toys with wood, and then color them and give it to me. So I had a box of that. He and uh, you know his mother and that group was coming to our, uh, to our group uh, from where they were, and they were caught by the army, Chinese army, and all of them were killed. Uh, my aunt was already with us, so she, she was not called, killed that time, but yeah. So, you know, uh, many people get killed, and you see them, and you know, things like that. So, uh, everybody... There's, there's not much secret, you know, mm -hmm. you all could see what's happening. I mean, um, we would call this childhood trauma in the West, I guess, what you have seen. Yes, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I can see that, uh, you know, people, uh, people, uh, you know, usually uh, uh, get uh, uh, very deep trauma. Uh, even going through uh, maybe even less uh, situations like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, most of us, even children, uh, out of this group, you know, uh, this group who could actually come to India uh, uh, was not that many. Like. Uh, maybe uh, less than 200, yeah. And uh, of course there was nobody who was uh, kind of counseling or anything like that on uh, these topics. Uh, but uh, I think mostly we were, um, you know, uh, psychologically, I think we were okay, kind of. Uh, uh, probably uh, one of the main reasons was that uh, we had lots of uh, love and support uh, from 
people around us, you know, our parents were there and, you know, everybody was like our parents, you know. And uh, we had uh, all the, you know, uh, emotional uh, support and things like that. So we felt, uh, of course, we, we felt uh, vulnerable because, you know, we could be uh, killed any time and things like that. But uh, we were ready, kind of. Everybody said, it is possible that we can become a mincemeat at one place any time. Uh, so we were kind of uh, prepared for that. So, you know, uh, it was kind of... Uh, and when we could uh, get out, so we were all uh, uh, grateful that we could get out because, uh, you know, it was so, so dangerous. I mean, it was almost an impossible task to be able to come alive out of this. We can't say we were happy, but we were grateful. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a little bit like that. Actually, Tibetans usually are very happy people. They always dance and sing and, you know, uh, like that. So we were dancing and singing, <laughs> even during these kind of times. And uh, uh, even when we already arrived in India, you know, we, we had kind of camps in India, and then it was... Lots of people died actually there because it was uh, too hot. It was the beginning of summer and, you know, uh, then we didn't know how to take care, you know, hygienically. And, uh, you know, there were mosquitoes, there were, you know, uh, all kind of things, you know, like leeches on the way. We had to sleep on the ground and uh, uh, in the morning, we find leeches all over the place, <laughs> sometimes inside our noses and things like that. <laughs> yes. Can you just strip them off? It's difficult to even yeah. take out because, you know, it, it's very difficult to, you know... How do you deal with it? <laughs> <laughs> it was very hard. There was no other way, you know, to deal. And especially then with the mosquitoes, you get, you know, all kind of fever and other different diseases. Everybody gets a diarrhea, everybody gets fever, and then many people die. Uh, but then people would say that, yeah, uh, we are fortunate because we can die in warm beds. Mm, so Meaning all together? Uh, no, meaning that we are not tortured mm. or killed. You know, we could just die. Uh, being sick, yeah. uh, that was a very fortunate. <laughs> kind of <laughs> <laughs> so optimism is a big part of Tibetan culture, can we say that? Or uh, gratitude, maybe seeing the... I mean, it's a... Uh, I think uh, uh, there's a kind of, a, yeah, a little bit, you know, uh, acceptance of the situation. And then, you know, if it is really bad, so then if it is a little bit better than the worst, you know, like, because we could see that in Tibet, you know, most of the people there are uh, imprisoned and then uh, tortured and, uh, you know, uh, they die terribly, painfully, you know. We knew that. So therefore, comparatively, it was, uh, uh, you die, but uh, at least you die of your own disease and not uh, somebody, you know, uh, torturing you. Uh, so, you know, uh, found that kind of, some kind of consolation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And looking back at what happened uh, back in those days in Tibet and the catastrophe there, how do you interpret those events, those unfortunate events? It was, uh, it was uh, very, very hard because, um, you know, of course, those grown-up people uh, knew exactly what was happening, but even children like us, we knew that uh, uh, everything was being destroyed, all the monasteries were destroyed, all the monks were, like, uh, uh, mostly killed or imprisoned, and most of the people were under, you know, uh, really difficult situations, and. Uh, 
lots of torture and things like that. And uh, uh, there were lots of, many people died of hunger. And then they were made into communes and the communes, they were not able to get food. And so, so many people died of starvation and the rest of them were like, uh, 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 tortured a lot, you know. Uh, so uh, we knew about those things. And uh, uh, the whole, not just the country was conquered uh, by a foreign kind of uh, army, but it's, uh, everything was destroyed. Uh, and uh, so we, we knew this. So we had like, um, everything was kind of gone and we don't, there was not much of hope that anything will remain. So we had, uh, you know, very little things, you know, and we didn't, we didn't know any other language than Tibetan. And uh, we didn't even recognize uh, most of the food, you know, like we knew rice. Mm -hmm. uh, First, I have, I have first seen potato uh, in Lhasa. <laughs> we never knew potato even. Uh, so in India, <laughs> once we were traveling and then we arrived uh, very near Lhasa, you know, in the kind of uh, uh, city area. Uh, we arrived in a field where it was, a potato was, uh, uh, was planted. And then somebody said that, oh, this is called, uh, you know, alu or, uh, you know, shogo, and you could eat it. Uh, so we took out some potatoes and they said, how to eat it? They said, you just, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, make fire and, you know, you uh, roast it on the fire. So you put it in the fire and then we tried to eat it, but uh, I think we didn't, uh, it, it was not cooked uh, enough, the potato. <laughs> so we ate uncooked potato oh. and everybody had problem. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so when we arrived in India, we didn't recognize any of these, you know, vegetables and things like that, you know, even dal and, so, you know, we didn't know what, you don't know how to cook, you know, anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, uh, we had problem. Everything was uh, foreign and new. Uh, so it was a little bit hard, yeah. So Rinpoche, what helped you psychologically or emotionally process all the things you've experienced during your childhood and travels? I think uh, some of the, you know, uh, some of uh, uh, well-respected lamas uh, had arrived, like uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama and uh, Karmapa and, you know, uh, uh, things like that, you know, like... Uh, and, and I think for Tibetans that was uh, very important, I think. That was very important. Uh, everybody were kind of... Uh, trying to uh, follow them and, you know, kind of, uh, they couldn't do much, but, you know, uh, they were like the source of inspiration and, you know, a little bit around them and uh, following their advice a little bit. And uh, I think that was uh, 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 important. And then uh, in the Himalayas, there is a little bit of uh, Tibet, you know, most of the Himalayan region uh, is influenced by Tibetan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was, uh, you know, uh, monasteries and, you know, uh, some, some Buddhists and things like that. And so they were very, very helpful, of course, you know, because we were of the same kind. And uh, yeah, that uh, was a very good support. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, just like that. And then people uh, were given to uh, 
to work on the roads. Uh, at that time, they were making, the India was, had to make roads in the Himalayas, you know, to prepare for the army also because the Chinese. So the Indian people could not go and work in high altitudes hmm. because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very hard for them. So Tibetans had no problem with their high altitude in, you know, uh, uh, cold place. Actually, the, it was too hot for them. <laughs> like Sikkim was too hot for the, most, of the, uh, most of us. So we, we did those things and, you know, people worked on the roads and it's how kind of people just survived and we didn't have too much like how it will be you know you couldn't you couldn't think about the future too much because it's just living day by day because uh, nobody had any any money or anything so you know just living day by day yeah. and has your training as a monk already started then no, not really. I was, uh, you know, during that time, there was no time to, to study or anything. Of course, uh, some things, you know, you would, uh, you would learn by, like, uh, in, the, in the night when you are sleeping, then, you know, people would uh, teach you how to say some prayers or things like that. And, you would learn by heart and things like that, but you know there was no real uh, time to study and things like that. I, I had uh, to start uh, all my studies after I arrived in India. Were you already recognized before India? Yeah, kind of. Yes, of course. Uh, there was, a, uh, yeah, I was supposed to be some kind of truku. Uh, <laughs> and something like that, but, you know, uh, it was not something that important anyway, because, you know, uh, we didn't know what, uh, what would happen, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you arrived in India, how was your life then? After we arrived in, uh, in India, uh, we were like... Uh, uh, a few months we were in, from the border, you know, we crossed the border. Our group was uh, uh, kind of staying in, uh, in the border of uh, uh, Arunachal Pradesh, that is India. And uh, 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 this, the other side, the border to Bhutan, uh, in a place, uh, in a village called Sunna. And then all the men, uh, able-bodied men, uh, went to fight against Chinese, uh, uh, what we call the Chuji Ganduk, the uh, Tibetan, you know, resistant army, you know. Uh, and then uh, uh, one day uh, we heard that His Holiness Dalai Lama was coming. Uh, so uh, we went down and, uh, you know, made some kind of, a, there's no real road, but, you know, uh, there was some kind of a road. So we put uh, stones on the two sides of the road and uh, colored them with white color uh, and then put uh, some uh, incense and, you know, the uh, smoke of uh, uh, what we call sang, and then waiting waited and then the, the Dalai Lama's group came. Uh, so there were lots of horsemen uh, and everybody was, you know, carrying guns and the horseback. There was only one person who didn't uh, carry a gun, but was carrying a kind of a tube, uh, looks like a tanka. So we, although he was wearing this, uh, what we call monkey cap, you know, uh, cap like this, mm -hmm. So we knew that he was Dalai Lama, so we went uh, for his, you know, blessing and he gave us blessing and then left. And immediately we went home, packed our things and left. Uh, and then we uh, slept on in, in snow 
uh, and then next day, you know, we had to cross the Himalayas. So it was like that we came. So we just followed the Dalai Lama almost the same day. Uh, so when we arrived in India, you know, in the Arunachal Pradesh, you know, uh, you know, we had nothing but, you know, like that. And then we stayed in a place called Musamari, that was the Indians arranged uh, a kind of a, a camp there, a long kind of houses of bamboo and with straw kind of, and uh, hundreds of people sleeping uh, in rows, you know, like that. Uh, so we we were there for like uh, quite a few months, I think. And then afterwards, you know, we decided that we will go to Sikkim. So they allowed us to go to Sikkim. So uh, we could the train, we took the train. And uh, that was the first time we saw the train. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, uh, we were told that we will get to this place where there will be train. And the train is uh, uh, train runs on the uh, iron road, and it's all made of iron, uh, and it's an iron house uh, rolling on the iron uh, road. And then uh, you know, but if you sit inside, you can put a cup of tea on the table, and uh, uh, it wouldn't spill. So I was thinking, <laughs> how can that be? You know? uh, I didn't understand the, we didn't have uh, wheels, you know. Oh, uh, right, right. We didn't have wheels in, uh, in Tibet, uh, <laughs> except this, you know, uh, prayer wheels. <laughs> so no chariots or anything? No chariots. Wow. So therefore, it was all mountains, no? So, so therefore, I was thinking the iron road will be like a flat iron road and so in you know it's an iron kind of a house so it must be a ball which is rolling on that <laughs> and then uh, how would you sit inside that and you know the tea will not spill yeah. you know i was thinking and thinking <laughs> uh, and i thought maybe there is two layers you know the first big kind of a ball and inside the small ball and then when the big ball rolls, the inside ball is kind of, uh, you know, not that. Not moving. Not moving, so it is kind of. <laughs> Other than that, I couldn't imagine. So when I first saw the train, uh, it was much simpler than <laughs> that. <laughs> so we went into the, into the train, and of course it was very crowded, and so we, we we left and uh, of course everybody got sick because you know nobody went by train that time motion sickness yeah uh, and uh, then uh, uh, suddenly at the station then lots of people come with uh, food and you know you want this food you know then everybody you know almost forced us to get uh, uh, you know the the buy for, it was for buy we didn't know that we had to pay, you know, oh, they forced us, you know, please eat this, eat this. And then so <laughs> we, everybody were forced, so we took it. And then they all left and the train left. So we thought it's for free, so everybody ate. And then when we came to the next station, they, they, they asked us back the, you know, the plates and then the money. <laughs> and nobody had money. <laughs> so what happened? So, it was it was quite hilarious. I think <laughs> they didn't get paid most of the time. I think because we didn't. Nobody had any money, you know. <laughs> so like that, that was the first train journey. <laughs> so then when we arrived in Siliguri, and then you know the, uh, we were taken to Sikkim and you know things like that. But you know, so it was very you know. Uh, very difficult kind of, you know. Uh, my father said that he had five rupees when he, the whole family had just five rupees when he first arrived in Sikkim. Uh, we had, in, 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 in central Tibet, in Lhasa, you know, they had uh, money. We had lots of them because we had uh, things to sell. 
Uh, but that was totally useless, you know, it didn't even worth the paper that's printed on that. So, and then people worked and people, you know, uh, if, if people worked on the road, uh, for, for able-bodied men, uh, they would get one rupee per day. And for women, 75 pesa. So, yeah, the women were paid much less than men. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it, at that time, it was kind of, you could, taught, you could kind of survive on that. Mm -hmm. And what did you do, Rinpoche? I did nothing. I, uh, I was uh, sent to this, uh, uh, the children were uh, kind of sent to, they, they created this uh, school. Uh, there was a monastery, Enche Monastery, and there they created a kind of a school for the Tibetans, Then they put all the children there. So, yeah, I went there and uh, everything was quite, quite chaos. So, you know, they didn't know how to put things together too much. So we all started from the first class. Mm -hmm. So, but I was already like seven years old, so I could learn quite quickly. So I learned alphabet, English alphabet and Tibetan alphabet, mm -hmm. writing and reading in one day, two days. And so I was promoted to the second class and then third class and fourth class. I was promoted uh, five or six times in one year. <laughs> Uh, but I was there like only one year and then I, I was sent to this young Lama's home school uh, in Dalhousie. They, they, one English lady called Mrs. Freda Bedi uh, started a school uh, for uh, Turkus, for the reincarnate Lamas uh, under the leadership of the, the Dalai Lama. He asked all the, you know, Tibetan Buddhist leaders to send the Tulkus there. There was a uh, school especially for uh, Tulkus. And uh, I was sent there when I was at about eight, I think. And uh, I studied there. Then the first time, a bit of English and, and Tibetan and, you know, usual Tibetan Buddhist studies and things like that. So I was there for two years. And that was very, very good for me because um, I also met lots of other uh, lamas and tulkus uh, of all schools. And uh, so we became very good friends. And th that friendship last, lasted all our lives. You know? mm -hmm. So it was, uh, uh, that was mainly the reason why I was, I came to the West also because some of my friends uh, were in the West, and then they wanted me to come also. So this kind of, you know. Other than studying, what was a part of your training? The Tibetan, we studied the Tibetan language, grammar, uh, dharma texts, and uh, uh, we also studied uh, some English, some mathematics, uh, some Hindi, because that was in Dalhousie, uh, which was at that time in Punjab. So we also studied some Punjabi. Mm. Yeah. And then sometimes we were given some, uh, some teachings on um, like a little bit of geography and, you know, a uh, little bit, you know, the social, uh, social studies or, you know, general knowledge and things like that and English. Yes, we had uh, uh, volunteers, uh, mostly from from the West, like uh, English and American and things like that, uh, to teach us English. Nobody spoke any other language than English. So that was good. That was good because uh, then you could directly, you know, you had to speak with them in uh, English, you know, so uh, that's how we uh, learned a little bit of English. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had campus and teachers from our own schools, you know, uh, different Tibetan uh, 
schools, so very safe instructions and things like that also. Uh, so that was mainly like that. And how did you move from studying to teaching? Well, uh, I was, uh, I, I, I did that, uh, Young Lama Sum School. Then I went back to India in Sikkim. And in Sikkim, there is, a, uh, there is an institute called uh, Namjal Institute of Tibetology. Uh, that was actually started by uh, the Tibetan government, the Dalai Lama, the Sikkim government, and the Indian government. You know, when the Dalai Lama was invited to India in 1956, uh, they, they, they knew that lots of problems would come. And so therefore, they wanted to start their uh, Tibetan kind of institute with library and, you know, all kind of things. So this was just inaugurated in 1959. So they started uh, a government of India scholarship for five you know, students to study, you know, all, all kind of Tibetan Buddhist uh, subjects and uh, and also Sanskrit and English and uh, you know general knowledge and things like that. So luckily, I was uh, I was able to get that, and I was I I got a scholarship. You know. It was hundred rupees per month scholarship, and that was a huge amount that time. Uh, so, you know, I studied there for, uh, for about three, three years, three years for the scholarship, and then I studied a little more. And uh, after that, then uh, uh, they started this uh, uh, Central Institute of Tibetan Higher Studies uh, in Sarnath, you know, under the University of uh, Sampunananda Sanskrit University, it's a Sanskrit university. And uh, uh, there, you know, the Tibetan lamas and monks who had already studied a uh, long time before, you know, were there. So uh, I was sent there by the Dalai Lama. Um, actually, I was, um, I was that time after I finished this uh, uh, kind of a scholarship, then um, Sister Palmo, who, you know, that, that lady, English lady who started this school, uh, she had become a nun. She became a Buddhist nun. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she was building uh, a nunnery in, uh, in near Himachal Pradesh. And uh, she was also helping uh, many Tibetans, you know, and things like that. So she knew me. So she said, you know, uh, why don't you come with me and uh, uh, I teach you English, you help me to translate, and then we will build this nunnery together. So it will be good if we work together. So Where? I said, yes, we are traveling okay. mainly, but this, uh, the nunnery is Tilokpur. It is uh, uh, not far from Dharamsala. Okay. Yeah. So we went there, you know, we went there and uh, we started to build the nunnery, and uh, uh, she invited 40 young uh, school girls uh, from different uh, schools, Tibetan schools, and wanted to see if they wanted to become nuns. So we were there, you know, uh, for, for a few months there. And then one day, uh, we went to see His Holiness Dalai Lama, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, she, she told you know she had uh, she told she had whatever she had to discuss with Dalai Lama, and then the, His Holiness turned to me and says, "Who are you?" And I said, "I am Ringo Tulku." And then he said, "What did you study?" So I told him what I studied, and then he grilled me for about one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because he's like that usually, you know, he is always very interested. So finally he let me go, so we went 
And next morning, six o'clock next morning, early morning, the representative of the Kaju school just arrived to our nunnery. And he says, you know, I, I need to meet Rungutu. So I, I went there and says, oh, he, yesterday his holiness called me and said, there is one young lama going around, drive, you know, wandering around. He's totally got lost. Sent him directly to this institute in Varanasi. So I had to go there. So that's how wow. I started my education. <laughs> yes. And from there, how did you come to the West and at what Oh, age? then uh, I didn't stay there very long, actually, but I continued my studies. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, later on uh, in Sikkim, I was offered a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we had uh, some kind of, a, uh, actually it was uh, the um, uh, centenary, uh, you know, of Mahatma Gandhi. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, he sent to them 100 years after he, he was born. I think it was around 60 something. Uh, and uh, at that time, it must be 66, 60 something like that. And uh, uh, there was uh, lots of uh, different programs, you know, including competitions like poetry writing and all kinds of things in all different languages and things like that. So one was a poetry on in Tibetan language. So at that time I was studying uh, Tibetan poems, Tibetan poetry, and uh, uh, one of my cousins, you know, he was studying with me, but he was not good with writing <laughs> poems. So, he, so we were together, so he dropped out and then uh, I didn't, so he he thought I was good at it, so he insisted that I write something. And then uh, I wrote something, and then I had lots of, uh, you know, respect and uh, great, you know, I was very influenced by Mahatma Gandhi, because uh, I was, you know, taken to lots of his uh, places and things like that, and he's read some of his books, and you know, I saw his uh, small villages, you know, he used to create villages and a uh, very simple way of living, you know, uh, his toilet and his, you know, all this very impressive. You know. So I, I wrote something about him and then uh, my brother, my cousin took it. So, by some chance, uh, I got the first prize wow. and, uh, uh, and got 1,000 rupees. Mm. And uh, actually, my teacher got second. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not because I was better, but I think the, the judges uh, were not that great. So, <laughs> uh, so, the Sikkim government thought that I was very good uh, in Tibetan language. Uh, so uh, it seems the, you know, I was uh, called by uh, the director of Tibetology where I used to study. One day uh, I received a message. I was in a retreat uh, a little bit in the countryside. And he said that if you have time, please come and see me immediately. So when I finished this retreat, I went down and he said, well, uh, the Sikkim government is looking for you, and you go and meet the uh, the secretary, the chief secretary. Uh, I said, okay. And then he said, if in case he offers you some job or something, don't say no, accept it. I said, of course. So I went there, and uh, there was this uh, big man, very busy, you know. I didn't know what was happening. So I said, I'm going to go and you wanted to see me. He said, yes, yes, sit down. So I sat down in, in a chair in front of After some time, he took out something, some piece of newspaper or something like that, and said, translate this. I don't remember exactly whether it was from English to, to Tibetan or Tibetan English, but some piece of. So I sat there and translated. And then he took that, put it on a kind of a file, I didn't know what file was. <laughs> and then he said, take this to the director of education. 
He didn't even ask me if I wanted a job. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know what was happening, so I took it, and then I found this director of education, and I gave it. So he asked me some questions, and uh, uh, I answered him. And then he called the secretary, and said, he, he looks promising. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> And then he said, you want, to, you want to have a job? I said, uh, yes, why not? <laughs> and then he said, when do, when do you want to start? I said, I don't mind, any time. He says, you would like to start now? I said, yes. <laughs> and then he called somebody, and I was employed like that, as the textbook writer. Wow. I was supposed to write textbooks for the schools of Sikkim, the intermediate language. Huh. So I was employed as a textbook writer, and I worked on it for eight years, and wrote textbooks and uh, trained teachers. And then uh, after that, then I went to we started a, a university college, and then I was appointed as a lecturer there. So you know, I worked uh, the, under the Sikkim government for 25 years. Yeah from the age of 17 to like 40 something. And uh, then uh, there was a, you know, like a, a time when uh, if you had worked for 25 years, you could retire mm. uh, with pension. So I retired with pension at the age of 40, 42. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I had, I had already started to uh, travel to the, you know, to Europe uh, to uh, teach Dharma. So uh, then, uh, this kind of, you know, I was mostly traveling to the West, and that's how my life continued. What was the first place you came to in your Actually, the first place I came to was uh, Samyaling. Oh. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a, a conference of uh, Tulkus, the old Tulkus with the name of Tulkus uh, uh, in Varanasi in 1988 uh, under his Holy Dalai Lama's uh, kind of uh, uh, guidance. For, for about a week, I think. So all Tulkus came there, so I also went there. And then Akon Rinpoche also was there, and Soja Rinpoche was there, everybody was there. So Akon Rinpoche said, you know, why don't you come to West sometime? I said, you know, I have no interest. I'm very happy in Sikkim, and I just stay there. I don't nick. He says, but what's, you know, why can't you just come for a visit? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, a visit would be nice. And then he said, yeah, you, you come. You just, uh, you know, do you have a passport? I said, I have no passport. Make a passport and then, uh, you know, uh, inform me and uh, I'll invite you to please come and just for one or two months just to, uh, you know, see what's there. You know, there's no need that you have to sh close yourself up lock yourself up in this, you know, Sikkim, which is where nobody can go at that time. <laughs> so I said, yes, why not? And then uh, the same day, I was also invited by the Sajjara Rinpoche. So I tried to make a passport, and it took me about a year or two to make a passport. And then I said I had a passport. So, so he invited me. So I went to Samuel Ling in the uh, Christmas of 89, and that is the first time I went there. It was uh, terrible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it was uh, dark, you know, so dark. And it was, uh, you know, even at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, it was still dark. Mm -hmm. By four o'clock, it was totally dark, and it was so cold. And you know, uh, even if it was totally uh, sunny whole day, uh, even the you know frost uh, would not melt. And then, uh, yeah, I went to 
different places in London and Brussels and uh, Ireland and uh, Barcelona. Mm -hmm. I like Barcelona very much <laughs> because that's where, you know, you could hear people talking and, you know, uh, cars making, you know, like uh, horns yeah. and, you know, uh, it was more sunny and, you know, so I drank lots of water on this Ramplas mm -hmm. to come back again. So <laughs> 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 I didn't like uh, the Brussels because it was too quiet. Yeah. There was nobody was talking and it was totally, you know, silent and even cars were like, shh, you know, only, only uh, like a, a sound they could uh, hear was like a, a lady with a, you know, a heels walking on the street, you know, talk, 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 talk. Yeah. It was very boring. <laughs> 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 yeah. So this is my first experience of the West. Yeah. Mm. And since then, you've been traveling across the planet in Europe, America, and yes. teaching. First time I came for three, three, three months, because that time I was still working there. And uh, we had vacation only in the winter. So I came in the winter. Uh, I came for three months and I gained five kilos. <laughs> Yes. Eating uh, what? <laughs> I don't know what I ate specially, maybe uh, uh, sweets, yep. you know, because here, uh, you know, you have lots of sweets to eat. You know? And sugar is rare in Tibet, is that right? Maybe uh, used to be it. No, no, it was not rare. I mean, uh, I was not in Tibet that time. I mean, of course, I was in India, no? Mm -hmm. India is full of sweets and uh, they, they eat lots of sweets. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, we eat sweets, but we are not, uh, you know, the Tibetans are generally not so much, uh, you know, sweet crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we, we like sweet, but we don't, you know, we, we don't need sweet. Somehow, that's the kind of the diet. This, you know, usually we can even have a feast. Uh, we forget about the sweet, <laughs> you know, usually. But then, you know, in the West, you know, sweet becomes very important. And it's sweet is very good sweet, you know, like uh, lots of cakes and, you know, all kind of, uh, you know, uh, dessert, you know, this dessert or desert. Yeah, dessert. <laughs> dessert. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe because of that, I gained five kilos, but then I lost it. Mm -hmm. The rest of the, then that came for four months and again, 10 kilos. And then that's how I start to gain. <laughs> <laughs> what is your perception of the Western culture and the Western mind, Rinpoche? I was a little bit when I was studying English, you know, and uh, uh, my teachers used to, uh, used to teach me uh, uh, some things about in the West in the Western way of thinking. And uh, they asked me to read uh, novels uh, so that you would understand uh, the, uh, the Western kind of uh, mind. So I did read lots of novels. Uh, and I think that helped a lot about, uh, you know, the, the people's kind of way of life and people's uh, kind of uh, uh, how they think and how they, uh, things like that. Uh, so, uh, but then, you know, of course, there's lots of things you don't understand. And, uh, and you know, uh, uh, just meeting people and sometimes people will tell you, uh, you know, also about the, uh, the language, you know, I, I had learned some English, but I didn't, I learned mostly by dictionary, you know. So I knew lots of words uh, by, me by, you know, memorizing it. But I didn't know how to pronounce most of them, mm -hmm. you know, because I just had the 
the spelling, but yeah. didn't, you know. So, you know, when I was, uh, I, mean, you know, I would usually mispronounce the words, and uh, sometimes people wouldn't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think around the first, first year or second, I don't remember, but I went to uh, Ireland, and uh, they asked me to give a talk on compassion. I gave uh, a talk in, a, in the church. And then next day, uh, Annie, you know, Annie, Annie Dibble here, mm -hmm. she invited me to uh, her house uh, for, uh, for a meal. And I went there, and there was uh, uh, one of our, her friends uh, there. And uh, she said, you know, yesterday I was at your talk, and it was very good and fantastic. Uh, and then she said, you know, but there was one word you repeated again and again, but I didn't understand it. I said, what word? She says, you said something like compassion, compassion. <laughs> what is that? I didn't understand. That was the main subject. <laughs> <laughs> compassion. <laughs> yeah. So like that, you know, after each talk, uh, many people would come up and say, you know, this was uh, not like that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, uh, and then... Yeah, I can't say that I understand fully uh, the Western mind, but you know, uh, people uh, help me. Uh, the people who talk about the their culture and their you know, differences and things like that, and so you know, I hope I learned a little bit. Uh, but I also, you know, uh, there are lots of differences in. In the, in the cultural level, language level, conceptual level. Uh, but, you know, below that, that's on the surface, you know. And below that, at the emotional level, you know, as a human level, then I think there is not much difference, you know. It's, mm -hmm. it's more or less same. So this is uh, uh, what I understood. Yeah. Rinpoche, you shared an incredible journey with us. Thank you so much. My final question is like, what is the one thing that enabled you arrive here and go through that journey? I don't see myself as anybody special or anything like that. Uh, I'm just a, a simple human being and uh, uh, curious uh, to learn and, uh, you know, uh, interested, uh, you know, I have an interest, interested uh, mind, uh, try to uh, understand what everything is and how things work and function and things like that. And uh, I was uh, always trying to learn. Uh, I sometimes say that I was, uh, I taught my mother how to cook. Uh, it was uh, partly true. Uh, because I was the first in the family who would, uh, you know, uh, have some language and also some contact with other, uh, other cultures and other, you know, people. So whenever I go somewhere and I find like a food or something like that which is, uh, which is uh, delicious, I would ask them, you know, how do you make it and things like that. And they, they tell you. And then I would go and tell my mother, uh, and sometimes she would try that, and it would work. <laughs> and then she would also do that, and uh, sometimes she would not uh, do it. Sometimes she would uh, uh, try and it wouldn't work, <laughs> you know, because I, I made some, uh, something not uh, correct. So in this way, you know, I, I'm interested, you know, in yeah. uh, lots of things. And, uh, so I'm interested to know things, what is, so I think we are all a student uh, all the time, you know, we never cease to be anything but a student. Mm -hmm. And that's what I deeply believe, that we, you know, uh, we, we start, we try to learn, and we try to learn, and we try to learn, and life is also study, and uh, everything we come across, uh, we just learn something from that, and uh, yeah, of course, I 
I studied Buddhism uh, uh, from many great masters. It helped me a lot. Uh, I think it also a little bit changed me. I learned from everything, also from other religions and things like that. Uh, I was inspired. And so, you know, that's kind of my journey. That's how I am. <laughs> I have not arrived anywhere. I'm just <laughs> a student. Impoche, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, for sharing with us. Thank you very you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.